Today we have the entire value chain here from the from the adaptive optics of Faceform. Stefan, welcome to the meeting. All the way to a key company in the sector like uh, like Opto, Marcus Friedel is with us. Today we are going to talk about microscopy. If someone says microscope, the most people think of this traditional scene with scientists staring down an optical device, which doesn't seem to have changed much for decades. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Modern industrial manufacturing of semiconductors, pharmaceuticals, and life science products like vaccines require constant supervision at a microscopic level. One slight change could mean a mistake, costing millions of euros in recall. Large corporates are telling us at EPIC that there is a growing need for high-precision process monitoring systems, delivering ultra-high-definition images in real time. I am sure you have heard about Europe's announced ambition of building a 2 nanometer chip foundry. 2 nanometers? Are we going crazy? That's like the width of three silicon atoms, or 35,000 times smaller than the thickness of a human hair. But if that foundry is going to exist, I want it in Europe. But back to the topic, because such a foundry will demand microscopy offering a smaller resolutions than the diffraction limit of light, right down to nanometer resolution. In semiconductors, the focus was always on the SEM, the scanning electron microscope. But in Europe and beyond semiconductors, we are witnessing a push for the single photon, multi photon, fluorescence, and confocal microscopy. Ultra fast lasers, single photon avalanche diodes, dichroic mirrors, filters, optics, laser scanners are already crucial components in modern laboratory microscopes. But how can we accelerate their adoption in the real time inspection systems of tomorrow? Now, here is an idea. Take a classical fluorescence microscope. A multi-wavelength light source goes through a tunable filter, which selects the wavelength to excite the fluorescence of a sample, while a detector collects its fluorescence. Simple, right? But what if we could focus the beam on a single point and scan it, or even better, use a multi-beam scanning solution and combine it with other principles, such as confocal microscopy. We could compile an ultra-fast 2D map of the fluorescence of a much larger sample. That is just a thought that crossed my mind. I'm sure you have others. Comments welcome below this post. On Monday, June 28th, at 3 p.m., we'll pick up this ongoing discussion in microscopy so we can meet the demands for high volume, high precision solutions in the most effective way possible. Who are the rising stars smart enough to deliver on this challenge? And which system integrators will they partner with? Sharpen your mind and focus on the epic question, then sign up to participate in our Zoom room to expand your microscopy network both online and offline. You can watch the results live or later in the EPIC YouTube channel. Next Generation Microscopy will make the impossible visible. You really cannot imagine how much fun I am having making these videos. But I have to say that multimodal microscopy is not my idea. And Sensofar, which by the way is in the room, has excelled a lot on this. We are going to go back to this topic. But first of all, I would like to let you know that we are only two meetings away from finishing this fantastic season of Epic Online Technology Meetings. We are coming back in September. I'm going to be traveling like crazy when I can, and you know that. But what I can say is that in September, we're also going to have one online technology meeting per week, all the way to Christmas, every Monday. Write it down in your calendar. As usual, I'm Jose Posto, the CTO of Epic, and I'm talking on behalf of a fantastic thing, a great thing, an amazing thing of technology expert at Epic. Together, we make our life fantastic but also we try to help our members with access to events, network, investment. We have the biggest website to find you in photonics, just in photonics.com, and we help 
or market we have our members with market reports i also would like to let you know that next monday laser cutting on the 14th of july just before we go on holidays meet infrared technologies for industrial manufacturing from Enwir cameras all the way to mid ir co2 lasers that's going to be spectacular but today today is all about microscopy. And first of all, I would like to acknowledge the support of our media partner, Electro Optics. Thank you so much for promoting all events worldwide. But most important, this meeting wouldn't be possible without support or sponsors today, all the way from Belgium, Caleste. You're looking for custom, customized CMOS sensors for different applications from SPATs to CMOS sensors in microscopy. Caleste, your partner, you're looking for filters. Chroma is the best manufacturer that we know that develops customized filters if you want to filter out a long range of wavelengths with high accuracy. But you're looking for a company that can provide almost any photonic components in the world, from quantum cascade lasers all the way to SPATs, Hamamatsu all the way from Japan with no most with something like 20 different locations in Europe. If you're looking for a company that can manufacture customized Customized thin film technology for filters or for coatings. Balsers Optics, recently, recently acquired by Materium. Balsers Optics is your partner. If you're looking for a partner in laser diodes, all the way from high power to visible laser diodes. Oxius, all the way from France. But you need the partner to do the packaging. The packaging and assembly and testing in volume production in Europe. We have a photonic base. OSAT company is fixed. Thank you very much for coming all the way from Enschede in the Netherlands. And finally, our key company, our key startup company developing multi-photo microscopes and Fento Second Laser. This is a company that has made a breakthrough in the field of multi-photo microscopy and they are here with us. Prospective. Thank you very much, all our sponsors today. Together, we are going to ask different end users and system integrators about their challenges. It's going to be a spectacular two hours. And afterwards, we go to watch football because Spain is playing afterwards. But first, these five companies are going to help us find the challenges. And thanks to the work of Dr. Sana Pika, we are going to go through all the different companies in the value chain and find how we can make connections, how they can work together. We have actually companies develop microscopes, develop photonic integrated circuits, develop microscopy illumination, cameras, detectors, adaptive optics, spectrometers. We have to do business and for that we have two hours. I would like to remind everyone, look your best because you are live in YouTube. Uh, YouTubers, thank you very much for being with us. If you have any questions, please post it in the chat and I will read it in the room. Please just remember that you want to get in touch with any of the participants today. All you have to do is send me an email, jose.pozo.epic-asoc.com and I will be so happy to make the introduction. And this is also valid for the people here with me, my friends in the Zoom room, please use the chat as much as possible. There is an internal private chat. Talk to each other. These two hours are to make business. But if afterwards you didn't manage to speak to Stefan from Faceform, send me an email and I'll make sure I make the introduction because I only all I want is for you to get to know each other. Elena, are you ready? And Elena and is my not ready. Co moderator today. She looks Ready? She looks fantastic. Elena, we're going to introduce now our first speaker today. He is the CEO of one of the most breakthrough startups in the field of femtosecond and microscopy enabling multiphoto microscopy. We're going to go to Prospective Instruments. Lucas Craner, CEO of Prospective Instruments. Thank you very much for taking the role of opening our microscopy meeting today. We are worldwide. We are really worldwide. So, Lucas, the attention of everyone in the world is focused on you. Thank you, Jose. <laughs> That's a great introduction. Thank you. Uh, so, I, I, um, uh, I will start to share my screen. Yes, please. That's okay. Yes, let's do that here. Okay, you should be able to see it. Yes. Okay, so thanks, yeah, Jose, for the introduction and also for the warm words at the beginning. I mean, uh, yeah, you put some pressure on me, <laughs> actually, from after your introduction. And uh, I put, a, uh, put together a few slides on actually where our microscope can be used. Um, and uh, that should just give an idea of, of uh, how it can be used, how it is used currently, and how future applications probably can be explored by, by visitors and, and, and other 
lot of people in the room here. So um, when when we, we started in 2019, actually just uh, a few months before the lockdown, and then we came to the idea that uh, multi-photon microscopy, uh, usually when people who know that technology, you deal with very complex, uh, you know, bulky setups built from many uh, components on an optical table, and that has to be maintained by a PhD student, typically. And um, we thought about uh, putting it in a package all together uh, to make a really turnkey compact uh, um, setup out of it that can be used, I mean, by let's, let's call it everybody in the field at least easily, so there's no maintenance required uh, and, and all that stuff. So the, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Need to go to the first slide, of course. Okay, we start over again. Um, so just a few words to the background of our company. Uh, we started in 2019, and uh, our focus was on turnkey, compact, easy to use, uh, multi-photo microscopes. And in order to achieve that goal, we knew from the very beginning that, that we need some kind of vertical integration, especially when it comes to the light source and uh, to the light engines, to the mechanically design, to the software. I think the putting stuff together is very important in order to get really a compact integrated system. I mean, you can get a laser, a femtosecond laser on the market uh, for a decent price uh, in the meantime, and you can get other components, but still you need to put it on an optical table. You have to, you know, you need all these mechanically mounts to steer the, to do the beam steering and all that stuff. So, so putting it all together in a package in a very compact package was our first challenge that we had to uh, had to solve. And uh, also I will come to that. And, and at, at the end of the presentation, we also started to do an imaging service, an in-house imaging service. So customers can pass by, send their samples, come to visit us and uh, check out the, the equipment. Uh, so just a few words to our core competence. Uh, and that's probably also the connection for other visitors on the show here on the channel that you can contact me anytime if you see a complimentary uh, know-how from us uh, to your need actually so please go ahead and then write me an email uh, so of course optomechanical uh, instrument design is a core competence of us of course we develop our own light sources so it starts from the femtosecond laser the illumination sources uh, uh, nowadays they are mainly led based of course uh, we do the embedded hardware and software control of the of the microscope, and uh, that allows us to bring an OEM solution for further integrators on the market, where you can actually integrate femtosecond lasers, the scanning, the Galvo scanners, the the uh, focusing, and all that stuff in an OEM package, which actually then um, uh, could go into another machine, like uh, from other integrators. Uh, we, we, of course, we do high resolution microscopy and uh, by doing all the multimodality, it, allow, it allows us to do label free imaging, uh, for example, metabolic visualization, cell microenvironment. Um, obviously, deep learning is a, a very hot topic at the moment in, in microscopy, probably, it's probably the most transformative technology which uh, currently arises since the since the invention of, of, of the objective, maybe uh, probably 200 years ago. Uh, and we also uh, ad adapt our platform to implement advanced deep learning algorithms for, for image analysis and, 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 and later on staining. Uh, and one focus of us is uh, to bring a medical device uh, on the market, which is intended for, for clinical applications. I will have a picture of that. Uh, at the end, but I'm not going to tell you the, all the details of it, but uh, you will see it at least. Okay, so our our first product is the MPX series, uh, the multi-photon microscopes. It's a compact all-in-one uh, integrated system. It combines uh, different modalities uh, into a one compact uh, package. It, it consists of a controller. It has a scan head, there's an umbilical in between, and in the scan head, actually, all the main components are tightly integrated. Uh, so we miniaturize, for example, the femtosecond laser, and we integrate it right into the scan head, which gives the advantage of having a very flexible setup. You can freely move the scan head, you, you can do a mosaic stitching, you can move millimeters, centimeters, uh, you can do a lot of uh, things. You can actually turn it upside down, so you, you go from upright, uh, 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 in the imaging to an inverted imaging. You will see a few pictures after that, how we're gonna do that. Uh, you can roll it in, it's very small, so you can roll it in into any lab. 
Uh, you can roll it in. If you do live animal imaging, you, you bring the microscope to the animal and not the animal to the microscope as it typically was. And also the, the demo aspect of doing demos in front of customers becomes, uh, the workflow becomes straightforward and very easy. So you don't have to visit like an imaging center from a very renowned company, but you can actually just uh, ask for a demo, get the demo in your in your uh, lab and then um, uh, try it out. Sorry, there's an ambulance in <laughs> outside. Um, anyway, so uh, that's how it looks like. Uh, so you can see here the controller, uh, this can head, uh, the umbilical uh, on the left side. Uh, the controller easily fits underneath the table. And uh, the scan head and the umbilical, you can place them on the table, actually. Uh, you install it in five minutes, so it takes you five to ten minutes to actually install the system on a table to bring it up and running. The PC, the control software, everything is integrated, so you just switch it on and, and uh, it works. Uh, on the right side, you can see a few images of our first prototype uh, that we, we built here. And... Um, uh, on the next side, uh, you can see it, it easily fits into a, a benchtop environment, like in a normal lab. So you don't need an optical table, no uh, air conditioned system. Uh, uh, I mean, when you do the imaging, you, you need some darkness, uh, or you can just cover it by, um, um, by a blanket, actually. But uh, it just fits in into any lab environment uh, very easily. You just roll it in, you set it up, and uh, you do need to take some uh, safety uh, precautions. Uh, there's a class three laser built in, but uh, the the education of the employees and the training of the employees regarding safe, laser safety is is easy. And uh, of course, there's an interlock also associated to the device, so that's that's actually also very straightforward and uh, doesn't disturb the the workflow too much. Uh, as I told you from the beginning that that we started our company right before the the lockdown in March uh, happened across. Uh, uh, most of Europe, actually, and uh, we had our first uh, device at the Research Institute in Geneva, actually, at the University Hospital of Geneva. And uh, so the, the researcher, Dr. Christoph Lamy, actually, he just took it home during COVID-19 lockdown. So he was fed up with it, and uh, he went to the lab and uh, got the microscope in his car, actually, in the trunk of his car. And he took it at home. And uh, so at night, you know, when it was uh, dark outside and he closed the, the, the curtains, uh, he continued his research. And probably I would assume without, of course, maybe you can prove me wrong, but probably it's the, the world's first multifocal microscope in home office. And uh, that even happened uh, during COVID-19 lockdown. So he got very nice results. He was very happy with it. And uh, probably it stayed there in his living room in his apartment probably for like three or four months. Uh, I'm not sure how his family actually uh, uh, took the opportunity to use a multifocal microscope, but uh, it survived at least a family, a daily family business. Um, uh, the next thing, as I told you, uh, because it's very compact and, and easy to install um, when you do live animal imaging, uh, you can actually bring the, the, the microscope to the animals. So usually they, uh, if you have these animal farms, uh, it's, it's, uh, they, they, um, they're kept in a very close environment, uh, temperature control, sometimes it's relatively warm in there. And it's cumbersome actually to take the animal out and to bring it to the experiment. So uh, especially if you do immunohistology uh, experiments, so you can actually bring the device to the animals if you want. So you, you can free up some space close to your animals and uh, start imaging actually directly in the animal farm, which uh, uh, gives a clear advantage for some researchers uh, doing time critical animal imaging. Uh, I think we have this set up now in the, Dr. Bruno Weber set up in, at the University of Zurich, and he's currently conducting these, uh, these experiments. This next setup, uh, I told you, it's, it's very easy. Actually, nowadays, you always have to compromise between uh, either buying an upright or an inverted uh, microscope uh, uh, configuration. And uh, we came to the conclusion that it's very, very simple, actually, just to turn it upside down, the microscope. So in five minutes work, you can uh, turn the microscope from an inverted into an upright uh, uh, imaging uh, configuration and, and, and vice versa. And that goes very quickly, it's very stable, and uh, it actually expands the usability of our, of our device. So we have a, a customer 
who is uh, working with an inverted uh, and upright configuration. So you can see here the, the inverted configuration. It's in a, in a lab in Munich, uh, run by Dr. Bettina Seiler. Uh, it's a collaboration between the Technical University of Munich and the uh, clinical um, Rechts der ISA, the hospital in, in Munich. Uh, and they do uh, acoustofluidic uh, imaging of, of, of cells. So uh, the good thing is, you know, you just, uh, position their microscope upside down and then the researcher can you know add their 3d printed uh, experimental chambers and holders uh, whatever they need still the xyz movement which is uh, enabled by xyz stages is still available so you do the standard xyz movement and uh, and uh, start your process right after installation so that goes in a few minutes uh, actually it takes longer to drive through munich uh, in traffic, uh, then actually to set up the uh, the microscope in the lab and and uh, set up everything and make it running, so it's very easy to to set up. Um, so we are currently working on a on a all in one device uh, for medical applications. Now that we um, uh, uh, control more or less the the bulky. Uh, uh, the bulky items that go into a multi-photo microscope. It's relatively straightforward to, to bring all the technologies together. So what you see, you see here is our first prototype of an all-in-one uh, medical uh, device for, for pathology applications. So we are currently working on this. And uh, yeah, maybe in a few months, I can share more details uh, about this uh, application here. A uh, few more slides here. So, so regarding our Im in-house imaging uh, service, so we have actually all these multi-modalities uh, in our uh, company, and uh, we thought about uh, for some researchers, it's still cumbersome actually to get a microscope into their lab, especially during COVID-19 uh, situations. So, we have been inviting a few researchers to pass by, and they can use our uh, they can use our setup uh, at our service. And uh, we also currently uh, installed, uh, have been just installing a light sheet microscope, like the Mesospim uh, setup, which is a fully automized uh, light sheet uh, microscope with uh, different excitation wavelengths and uh, 10 millimeter field of view. And, and this is a complementary technology. We are currently looking at how to um, uh, bring light sheets uh, into a benchtop form factor. Actually, just to repeat, you know, a compact turnkey system that can be easily be used by researchers and uh, to avoid this complexity that all the light sheet microscopes so far have, um, in our opinion, uh, suffered a little bit. So uh, that brings me to the last slide. Uh, these are just a few impressions that we made from images. You know, at the end, we look at images and uh, we all love the images, I uh, think, in microscopy. And uh, that just give you a little bit of a few of um, an impressions of what we did. So we did uh, uh, pollen Z stacks, uh, prostate uh, fibroblasts, uh, chicken embryo with the light sheet, uh, the artificial arterias. So all of that stuff currently comes nicely together. And um, that brings me to our last slide. So thanks for the attention. and. Uh, yeah, if we can connect somehow, you know, with integrated services, OEM capabilities of, of multi-photon instruments, uh, please feel free to contact all me. the connections possible, for sure. That's what Thank we're you. here for today, all of us, all the people in the room. And thank you very much for this great presentation and uh, introduction to multi-photon um, a microscopy and fantastic images at the end. And of course, we have plenty of questions to you. So let's get directly to them. We have a question from Amiko Antolov Antolovic from uh, PI Imaging. Amiko, um, uh, do you want to ask a question? Don't forget to unmute yourself for that. Hello, Elena. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. So. I was wondering, you, you mentioned about the super resolution technique. So I was wondering, wondering which one are you, uh, which technique? Yes, are I mean, there, there we are currently, uh, currently focus on, uh, focusing on computational methods. So there are a few computational methods out there that allow you to, to do some deconvolution on a, on a, on a computational side. So that's what we are currently trying to do. I mean, because we control all our optics and uh, from the laser to the, I mean, of course, the objective you buy, but the rest we control very tightly. It's uh, relatively easy for us to uh, characterize the PSF very 
precisely and that gives us the uh, uh, capability to uh, deconvolve on a computational side uh, very efficiently. So, so that's what I meant by doing the uh, types of transfiguration as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, a question related to that, uh, considering demoing, uh, do you do demoing in Switzerland or Austria? Or yeah, worldwide, that? yes, worldwide. World, okay, okay. Fantastic. Great. Miko, while we have you on the stage, maybe you will also show yourself to us, but uh, maybe you also show, show us very shortly what um, the eye imaging is uh, doing. So share about a little bit more with us. And you want me I to believe share you the, have a slide prepared for that. You want me to share the slide as well? Sure. Okay. Let me just uh, open that up. A green button at the bottom of your screen and it's coming up. Yes. Fantastic. So at Pi Imaging, we are uh, developing spider race and on the bottom you can see the uh, uh, spot 23 uh, our, our product with integrated time tagging. So I was wondering, when I asked the question uh, to, to you, and uh, I thought maybe you do some uh, super resolution conf confocal techniques. One of them is, of course, uh, uh, image uh, scanning microscopy, which enables you to you know, get the best out of the uh, <laughs> virtual pinhole that is created by the, by the pixels. Um, so you can see here on the right-hand hand, right -hand side some specs, um, very good sensitivity, very low jitter, so if you're looking for um, uh, time-resolved applications like uh, FLIM, FCS, uh, luminescence, um, and you want to have also a lot of signal, I think our detector rays are a good choice. Um, and I believe also Giuseppe is going to talk about um, a very similar topics. He has done uh, great work uh, in that field as well. So I look forward to also hearing his presentation. So if anyone is interested in SPAD arrays and uh, please uh, get in touch with me. Um, we would also be glad to uh, collaborate with prospective instruments, potentially also having this instead of the PMTs. That looks very interesting. Actually, we, we are looking into that, yeah, in, into the FLIM, of course, adding a FLIM as a, FLIM is a very powerful modality. So definitely that, that, that looks very interesting. Yeah. Okay, Thank yeah. You. Thank, thanks, thanks to you and uh, yeah, let's get in touch. Mm -hmm. Thanks, fantastic. So we're already uh, starting some collaborations here and in the chat there is even a question about the SPAD arrays. So that uh, means that uh, there is another conversation that needs to happen. But uh, coming back to, to Lucas, there are so many questions to you. So I would like to go to another Lucas we have in the room from light conversion. So would you like it, to ask your own question? Um, sure. So um, excellent, excellent device. Uh, very exciting to see that you have the laser integrated inside the scan head. That's a, that's a really uh, necessary feature. So I was wondering, uh, what are the excitation? What's the excitation wavelength range that you can achieve with this integrated source? Mm -hmm. So at the moment it's it's 1040, but we are currently working on a tunable version, which brings us from 750 up to 980, and then from uh, 1100 to 1300 nanometers. So we definitely, uh, I think that was one of the first learnings that that uh, tunability is a key requirement and. Uh, yeah, well, we had I, to I, learn I, it the I, hard way, <laughs> but uh, it's definitely a requirement. So we need tunable lasers. Okay, that's perfect. I question. Could, could, couldn't agree more. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I would sure. say. But okay, so 10, 1040 at, at this at the moment. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. We have another laser related, obviously laser related question from William from Erythioma. William, would you like to ask a question yourself? Hi, uh, hi everybody. Thank, thanks uh, enough for the introduction. Um, yeah, I was just wondering um, because uh, you, you are using femtosecond lasers for your instruments and uh, do you have uh, any um, issues or challenges uh, with the synchronization of uh, the laser with the Galvo scanners? No, I mean, we, we, um, you have to take care of that. Yes, that's true. But um, it's... it's um, so you need to solve the problem, yeah, basically. But you can do that, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Uh, and and so the, the what kind of femtosecond lasers? You, is it modlock lasers? And yes, this, it's a fiber laser. Yeah, it's a modlock fiber laser. Uh, okay. With, uh, a few hundred milliwatt of power and hundred femtoseconds. 
Okay. And um, is it uh, uh, in, in your interest to have uh, a femtosecond lasers that could be uh, easily synchronized to your Galvo scanners or, uh, to, or to your own clock signal in your system? Mm, well, we, solved, we have solved the problem that the, uh, the femtosecond laser is the clock, actually. Oh. So, so okay. we, we, we synchronize the other way, mm. okay. which is actually straightforward. Mm. Okay. So, Okay, that sounds like an interesting discussion that might actually need some continuation afterwards still. But we have more questions. Uh, we have a question from Stefan Weber from Faceform. Stefan, how about you ask it to Lucas directly? Yes, I was wondering with uh, that many modalities, you might have all kinds of aberrations, probably spherical ones that are pretty annoying. Do you have some adaptive elements to compensate for them? No, not yet. Uh, I think we're, we're definitely open for using those. Uh, we see a need for deep imaging. So if you go above uh, three, 400 micron, 500 micron in depth, um, in, in, for example, live animal imaging, the, the yeah, thing, signals get a little bit dim. So uh, I could very well imagine there's a need for uh, corrections, aberration corrections, yeah, adaptive corrections. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay. Moving on, we have a couple of questions from Felipe from Horiba Scientific. Felipe, what's on your mind? Hello, yeah, first question was about the, the industrial that I am. Uh, is, are you CE certified? Have you gone no, the process? not yet, not yet. Okay. Good luck, <laughs> I wish it, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's us. But, yeah, I know, uh, I know. <laughs> don't, don't underestimate the, the work to do. Uh, second question. Um, yeah, I see that you have this big box suspended uh, above the sample. Uh, how did you solve the, the stability potential issues? Uh, I think the, the, um, it, it's a very good mechanical design. So we did, we did some FEM simulations uh, for vibrations and, and uh, potential vibrations. I mean, the, the only vibration source that we have is, is, is from the Galvos, of course. Uh, that we try to minimize, um, and uh, so far, so far we didn't see too much uh, issues there. I mean, if you do very long, uh, uh, long time lapse, uh, then it's true we we have seen some uh, some changes, but we were not sure actually is it from temp is it from temperature swings, you know that that involve the the, the stages. Uh, in the lab, or is it from a, from a temperature swing that goes on to the, the core of our design? So still some debate about that. Um, but yeah. for long-term uh, uh, cell imaging, yeah, there is. Um, it's not as stable than uh, than a rigid, you know, typically microscope uh, setup. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question all the way from University of uh, Southampton from Summit, would you like to ask a question? Hello, very interesting talk, uh, I enjoyed it. I was wondering uh, that the microscope system which you showed, especially with the umb umbilical, where you can actually take the laser, uh, take the imaging to the animal, is that is that umbilical uh, available? Can that be available separately if you didn't want the microscope base as such? The reason why I'm asking is because we, for example, develop lots of uh, microscope systems ourselves mm -hmm. uh, for, for research, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. we do optical engineering at, in our labs. And uh, I, I can already think that this could be very useful that if we took our big bulky microscopes and converted them to something more portable, much something which can be actually taken to a mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if we're gonna <laughs> we really wanna sell it. <laughs> to be honest, uh, maybe not. <laughs> no, uh, I think um, it's 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 required, and there's some yeah some special cables in it probably that you don't need, and and only us who needs it, who needs it. So uh, I'm not sure if, if 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 that will be our business <laughs> business model of the future. Maybe not. Maybe then as a collaboration, maybe. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe uh, you, you can buy a microscope and then take the cable. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting business model popping yeah. up over here. But let's get back to some uh, technical, other technical questions. We still have a few to you, Lucas. We are not done with you yet. Uh, Almut from uh, Chroma Technologies, a question which I think is relevant for all developers of. Uh, uh, microscopes. Almut, would you like to ask a question to Lucas? 
Yes, hello. Um, thank you very, for the very interesting uh, presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, I was just thinking of uh, if you have any need of special filters for the 2P or 3P imaging and um, excitation filters, digroids, anything special that you might need or um, yeah, are you I mean, working that's... with standard products? Yeah, we, we do work with, I mean, we, we it's designed in a way that it can work with standard products because usually customers tell us what they need for filters. Uh, so, so we have, of course, the standard sizes and, and diameters available in our mechanical housings so that, that usually customers, they all most of them have already filters, so they want to mm. be adaptable and interchangeable, uh, which, which um, that we tell them whatever you need to be can milk it. So, so it usually comes from the customer side, actually, the filter okay. request. Mm. Okay, fantastic. Well, besides uh, Chroma, of course, as uh, we all know, we have uh, Materian Razor Optics uh, here in the room who also can be helping you out with uh, different solutions in terms of uh, optics and filters. But uh, I would like to bring attention to um, uh, Didier, uh, who is also in the room from Lambda X. Uh, would you like to share with us a little bit what Lambda X is offering? Yes, sure. The so microscopy Lambda offer X. of Lambda X. Yes, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can also see your slide, except it's not in the presentation mode yet. Yeah, it, it will stay like that, I think. Uh, so uh, uh, at Lambda X, we do optical engineering for third party. And in the past years, we have built um, several microscopes for uh, different customers. And uh, based on this experience, we have uh, developed uh, an architecture uh, for, for microscopy, for custom mi microscopy, uh, which includes all the optics at, at one side. And we have developed specific electronics at the other side, uh, all depending on the application, obviously, we can tune this uh, on, at the benefit of the, of the customer. And we have done this for many applications uh, from cell transfection uh, to introduce materials in the cells for uh, fluorescence activated droplet sorting, those two for, for spin off of university, for blood analysis with uh, our partner Ovisio, um, or for uh, cell monitoring. And in this case, we, we are also going to production, so we produce the system for Ovisio. So this is a service we offer. Uh, in general for optical systems, but specifically for, uh, for uh, microscopy here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you and very much. Uh, actually, who always has opinion. Is Jose. Yes. 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 Thank you. Go. What a way to start the meeting, right? I, I don't think prospective instruments can ever complain about lack of questions. But uh, Lambda X, uh, you are an OEM. OEM uh, module manufacturer. And I would like to ask you, when it comes to uh, doing microscopy for environments in which there are large surfaces and throughput, what is the main challenge for a company like Lambda X? So we, uh, the, the, the challenge depends on the application, I would say. Uh, so we can develop for, for any kind of applications, also in microscopy. Um, we have recently been requested to develop on the same basis um, an optical module for, uh, for very large surfaces for uh, uh, disease detection <laughs> that is currently acute, I would say. So this is something we are doing now. Currently, we are uh, doing the first three prototypes uh, based on the same architecture where we have an enlarged field of view. For this, we, do, we just do custom designs of, of the lenses uh, when it is ne needed. Because today I brought two companies who I think they should talk to you after the meeting and you're going to meet them. We brought from, from Spain, we brought Sensofar and from France, we brought, we brought Unity SC. We're going to give the floor now to Unity SC. I want to really understand what it is to do microscopy when, it, when the challenge is throughput and the challenge is the large surface. And this is a success story that we have in Europe. Tristan Convier, thank you very much for joining our microscopy meeting today. It is great to have you here, the floor and the attention of everyone in this global meeting goes to you, Tristan, goes to Unity SC. Tristan, you may be muted because yes. I can't hear you. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very no, much, Jose. Um, so uh, thank you for offering, offering me this uh, opportunity to, to give this, uh, this talk. I'm going to share my screen.
You see my screen now? Is that clear? Yeah. So um, I am an optical system architect at Unity SC, and I'm going to talk about photonics in semiconductor process control. My slide is not going, I'm sorry. A space bar normally helps. Yeah. Exactly, thank you. So I will first give an introduction to uh, the company and uh, talk about uh, the portfolio of technologies. And uh, then I will focus on two particular projects in which uh, it involved uh, photonics uh, and uh, very challenging, uh, innovative uh, solutions. So Unity was uh, created in 2016 from the merge of uh, three European companies, Fogal Nanotech, Altatech, and HSEB. Our headquarters are located in Grenoble in France. And our mission is to build solutions in metrology and inspection for the semiconductor industry. Our main applications range from advanced packaging and wafer level packaging, CMP, power device, MEMS, LEDs, and substrate manufacturing. We have a, a broad range of technologies in our portfolio. So uh, in the upper, upper part, I uh, show what is called metrology solutions, which are mainly used for uh, sampling the, the wafers, measuring uh, a few number of locations and having a very uh, sharp, accurate metrological uh, measurement. The other uh, frame uh, is for high throughput full wafer defect detection, which requires high speed uh, and high sensitivity as well. So we use different kinds of interferometry, such as time domain, OCT in the infrared, uh, spectral interferometry and reflectometry in the visible, confocal chromatic, white light full field interferometry to, to have a, a full, uh, an image of a full area in one shot. And for the high throughput uh, inspection detection, we use phase shift defectometry, dark field inspection, 2D or 3D line scan inspection and scaling, scanning Doppler, which is uh, one of the, the topics I will focus on here in this presentation, along with the 3D line scan. Basically, we have photonics in pretty much everywhere in our uh, technologies, but I think these last two are the ones with the, the most innovative and challenging photonics. So first I will start with the confocal chromatic. The principle of conf confocal chromatic is as shown here. So it consists of a white light source here, uh, a pinhole for collection here, a beam splitter, and an objective lens with a chromatic uh, aberration. So the, the purpose of this objective is to have a longitudinal chromatism in such a way that each wavelength of the light source is focused at a different height. So the light reflected by the sample, by the object surface here, propagates back to the filtering pinhole. And there only the, the light, which is out focus, will go through, corresponding to one wavelength. And the other wavelength, corresponding to out of focus light, will be filtered out. The spectrometer analyzes the transmit transmitted light and algorithms are here to detect the peak position. And from this wavelengths, we can relate back to the height of the, of the location of the, on the object surface. So such a system gives one measurement at a time. In order to parallelize, we, in the commercially available probes, there is an array of, wave, of uh, pinholes here for the source and an array of pinholes for the collection. These pinhole can be rotating disk or fiber optics. 
uh, our invention consists of using waveguides instead. Uh, waveguides for splitting a single light source from a supercontinuum laser into an array of waveguides and waveguides also for the collection, playing the role of spatial filtering as well as routing towards the spectrometers. So the key advantages of this configuration is to achieve a very large channel count for high speed surface topography and a high channel density for very sharp micrometer range lateral resolution. Here is a picture of our confocal chromatic objective. So it is a line scan uh, microscope. So it means we need to raster scan the, the surface of the wafer by moving the sample in an XY stage. This uh, example application is for microbump process control. So microbumps are used for interconnects between uh, semiconductor chips. Uh, here on this picture, we can see uh, it's a 3D image of the surface where each dot corresponds to a bump. Okay, these are 15 micron bumps. And the color scale is the height. Uh, so this image is obtained by spectral processing and wavelength to uh, pixel height uh, calibration. Then from this image, we apply some algorithms for segmentation and bump, bump height measurement in order to produce this map. This is a map of the representing in a color scale the height of each individual bump here. And this is what is meaningful for our customers. Uh, here's an, an insight into how we achieved that. So we've, we've been working with Team Photonics, who will give a talk uh, right after me. Uh, they produced uh, optical uh, waveguides with a very high count, 512 channels, very uh, low loss, high homogeneity in, in over a very broadband visible range. And capable of handling the high power coming from the supercontinuum light source. They have worked on the optimization of these waveguides in order to match with the, uh, op the optics, uh, the chromatic objective that, that has a particular point spread function. And in this process, they achieved to go from a very disturbed peak that we see in this kind of spectrum here, uh, towards a much nicer peak shape, which is suitable for a very high resolution uh, vertically. And they have also worked on the optomechanical integration of these uh, components. So we achieved a very good working point with this technology. And here we are in uh, this meeting in order to talk about what could be the future of photonics to help to help us uh, making better microscopes. So I would say that the future challenges concern scalability and versatility. So scalability, we are already on a good uh, road with uh, waveguides, but uh, next step would be to integrate the spectrometer on chips as well, to integrate sources on chip and to stack multiple chips. For versatility, I meant using this uh, confocality, not only for chromatic uh, confocal, but also for fluorescent imaging or many other applications could be possible. So for this, we would need to extend the spectral bandwidth. Finally, I will talk about this uh, technology called dark field Doppler. Uh, which is a patented technology from Unity. So usually in dark field inspection, laser light source strikes the surface of the object and the scattered light is collected by a detector. In this way, we can detect particles. But in a transparent substrate, we would not be able to distinguish between front side particles and back side particles. So our technology 
allows us to separate front side and back side particles by actually crossing two beams right on the front surface. And here we have a volume of fringes, interference fringes. In such a way, when the wafer moves, uh, a particle that will go through these fringes will produce a uh, frequency signature that can, we can be detected and that we can separate from any backside particle that will produce intensity, but no frequency signature. It allows, for example, to separate the, the front surface of a glass wafer uh, to the interface uh, with the silicon uh, carrier. And this is an image uh, from the Fraunhofer Institute of ENAS showing here on the left side the front surface with some particular defects and here the back face, I mean the interface between glass and silicon where we can see all the voids at the interface. And this is a very uh, useful information for our customer. In order to achieve that, we have patented a uh, technology using waveguides, uh, which allows to have two beams crossing right at the surface of the sample or below if we need. And it allows to parallelize the number of scanning locations and as well the fringe period in order to size different particles. So these ad the advantage of such a configuration is obviously the optical, equal optical path lengths and polarization maintaining properties of optical waveguides. Uh, and as well, the al alignment free, which is very useful for manufacturing and long-term stability. And such a technology allows for scalability. We have solved some challenges. Uh, for example, the power handling, especially in the blue or UV and insertion losses, and as well the interface with the optics and the beam shaping, because waveguides, you're usually coming from the telecom industry, they don't need much uh, interface with uh, free space optics. And in this sense, this is quite new. Uh, also the stray light suppression was one of the the, the challenges we, we needed to solve. Finally, I, I wanted here to summarize the, the general points that we were interested in, in order to go further in, in solving uh, next challenges. So generally for microscopy applied to the semiconductor industry, we need high power. We need high power and short wavelengths in order to achieve low resolution. So uh, going to blue and UV is always our key uh, uh, requirement. Using high coherence light source, but also low coherence light sources, uh, using fibers for high power short wavelengths, especially you know, end capping the fiber tapes, controlling the optical path length for interferometry, Bro using waveguides for broadband, uh, microscopy uh, in the visible range is uh, one of the key aspects we're looking for. Uh, having spectrally flat splitters, when I mean spectrally flat, I mean avoiding any kind of ripple that uh, would make a parasitic uh, uh, interference. And generally, we need to interface our photonic devices, our waveguides with free space optics. This requires micro machining, micro alignment, uh, which mean which must be scalable, industrial, reliable, and cost effective as well, in order to achieve the scalability. It is a fantastic list of challenges and we have a big room of people who are here to help you out to solve them. Before getting right to, uh, to, to, to your collaborator, existing collaborator, uh, Kim Stotonic. I would like to first give the floor to Alvaro Cavena from EMBL. He has a very interesting question to you. So Alvaro, would you like to ask your question? 
Sure, thanks, Elena. Um, uh, Tristan, thank you for the talk. Um, have you thought of any possible biological applications of the system? Yeah, so usually uh, biological applications require uh, transmission. Uh, no, it's not always the case. Uh, whereas we focus on uh, inspection uh, of uh, semiconductors. So we always or almost always use reflect ref reflection. Uh, this is one of the, the differentiator. And uh, but apart from that, you are right that uh, we can extend this kind of technology to several biological applications. Fantastic. Maybe that's a room where you two can cooperate and establish this new biological application of your technology. How about that? But let's do that in follow up, not directly in this room. But as promised now, let's go to Andrin from Team Photonics, uh, the cooperation uh, which is already happening with Unity SC. Yes, well, thanks for, uh, for giving me a, a quick talk. Let me just share my slide. All right, you should see it full screen now. Yes, fantastic. Okay, great. So uh, yes, at Team, we make two, uh, two, two types of products. Uh, one are um, air-cooled sub-nanosecond lasers. So we're at the microscopy meeting, so I think it's worth mentioning. But I will rather focus on integrated optics after what Tristan has shown. So uh, these waveguides he's shown, they're made by the ion exchange process in our uh, internal uh, fab line, I would say. And of course, they have the advantage of um, uh, transparency all over the, the, the bands of interest, I believe, for microscopy. So from the visible, from about 400 nanometers. So the UV is a bit more tricky, but uh, up to, uh, to the edge of the, of the short wave infrared and the mid infrared. Um, and I think here we quickly see the, the process flow at the bottom. So it's, uh, it's worth mentioning as well that we can, because this process flow is streamlined and somehow very, like much simpler than, than standard PLC or maybe SIN, for instance, uh, we are able to make very large chips uh, at, in a cost-effective way. So that's, uh, that's exactly what Tristan has underlined. So uh, sorry, I just had a, like another slide that, that shows again the, the module we've, uh, what we've developed for Unity. Sure, this, is a, this is another view and actually gave us some ideas uh, outside of uh, confocal chromatics. So we believed we could also address Raman or OCT. And because um, our chips identify interface pretty well with standard uh, microscope, uh, microscope optics, uh, essentially uh, they can be quite versatile. And because there can be NA issues you know, with, conf with confocal that may not exist in Raman or fluorescence imaging, there probably is a lot of room for, uh, for technical developments. It's also worth mentioning that uh, our uh, waveguides, they allow for integrated spectrometers. Today, this is a technology that is exploited by resolution spectra systems, also, also in Grenoble, even though they act under the Merck life science name now. But yeah, after, after Tristan's talk, I think it's, uh, it's once again worth mentioning. So yeah, in a sense, we, we push a technology, but we don't have like that much applicative knowledge. So we are always eager to you know, engage conversation. Thank you very much for this. And now let's have a, a, a quick round of questions. There's a lot of room for cooperation here. We're going to start with a company in Belgium that actually develops these custom CMOS sensors. And we have questions about the numerical aperture of the way. Jan Vermeer, and welcome to the meeting. What's on your mind? Yeah, I was looking to, um, let's say, the schematic diagram that uh, Tristan has shown and where he goes from, let's say, photonic integrated circuit to the sample and back. Uh, but uh, let's say my question was how efficient is, in fact, that light coupling? Or do you take special measures in order to uh, um, ameliorate the light coupling between the, the sample and, and the photonic circuit? Thank you for this question. Um, so uh, we... Uh, had to work uh, on optimizing the waveguide geometry together with the uh, PSF of the optics in order to, to match, uh, to achieve the best coping efficiency for the, the back reflected light. In order to achieve actually not only best coping efficiency, but uh, also the modal propagation in the waveguide uh, should not disturb the, the quality of the signal, which is collected. So there is a trade-off between signal quality 
and signal a quantity. But we have found a very good trade-off. Thank you very much for this. And we continue. We have one of the giants in Europe in the field of microscopy, imaging, and inspection, Horiba Scientific. Philip Devetignais, what's on your mind? Philip? Um, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, just uh, being interesting in the in the speed of, uh, of the measurements. Uh, yes, how fast can you do and can you be triggered outside? So um, maybe to be coupled to anything else in uh, your experiment. Yeah, exactly. So um, it is triggered definitely in order to uh, be synchronized with the motion of the XY table. Uh, we achieve speeds of, uh, it depends on the, you, you can always uh, reduce the, the range, the measuring range, but let's say with full measuring range, we achieve a speed of 10 kilohertz with 512 channels in parallel, which means five millions of points per second. Is that, is that enough? Uh, for the applications, or is that still yeah, a challenge? Are you that, looking for that, collaborations that is, that to go faster? For me. So yeah, uh, so how does it translate into uh, numbers for the semiconductor industry? If we scan uh, a wafer with, uh, say, five micron resolution, we achieve, uh, we, we, we go higher than the, the 20 wafers per hour uh, limit, okay? This is like the minimum for inspection, say. So 20 wafer, wafers, I mean, big wafers, 30, 300 millimeters. We can scan with five micron resolution uh, in inspection conditions. Then in order to go to smaller details, smaller bumps, we need to, uh, to scan slower. Uh, and for this reason, uh, going to scalability with several chips or higher number of waveguides or higher intensity of the light source. This is key to, uh, to uh, multiply by two, four, eight, the speed of this uh, microscope. I'm going to come back to you on this particular parameter after the presentation from Instituto Italiano. But before that, I go from giant to giant, from Horiba to Hamamatsu. Sebastian Bier, what's on your mind? Yes, I had a short question that was partially probably already answered. Uh, what is the spectral range of the confocal? So you've shown a slide with the waveguides operating in the red near infrared. Mm -hmm. I guess those are a couple of trade-offs regarding performance of the systems and performance of the waveguides. Is exactly. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Uh, and uh, can you comment on that. What uh, is that the optimum uh, wavelength range, or would there be any? Would it be better for you to move more into the blue? So uh, it's a question of uh, finding the, the right working point. We've, we've targeted to uh, have a range between 550 and 900 nanometers because it was uh, compatible with our uh, overall system, including light source and uh, optics and detectors. Uh, we can move this uh, working point towards uh, blue uh, but uh, having a extremely broad range, uh, visible light from, let's say, 400 uh, up to 900 is not achieved yet. But uh, this is one of the key uh, that we are, we are pursuing. Okay. This time, we're much. going to come back to you on this, but it is four o'clock. It is four o'clock. It is time. I don't like the word keynote because you're a keynote, but it is time to have the speaker here that we work so, so hard to have from the European Molecular Biology Lab, the association of 27 member states. We have here the head of microscopy, Alvaro Crevena, looking for partnerships, looking for challenges and looking for bottlenecks to solve. Alvaro, Thank you very much. It means a lot. Grazie mille for you to, for, for being here with us. We want to help you. We want to help EMVL. It is a big deal for us that you are in the room. Tell us how we can help you. The floor and the attention of everyone goes to you, Alvaro. Uh, thanks, Jose. Uh, it's really hard to keep up with, with you uh, sort of to really talk in that sort of engaging form. Um, and I hope I don't disappoint uh, too much. Um, I actually have to say that I, I, I saw the video where you're advertising, I think, the Meet Infrared Alliance. And I wanted to attend just because of how, you know, how much you promoted that. Uh, it's not really, really interesting. 
Um, all right, so um, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna share the presentation if I find it correctly. Uh, there we go. I'll tell you what we are. All right, so thank you everyone. Um, so just gonna give you a brief uh, presentation on, on who we are and what we do. So um, EMBL, as uh, Jose mentioned, so it's, a, it's an intergovernmental um, organization um, founded in actually in 74 uh, by nine European countries. Now we actually are, uh, have 27 member states uh, with two associate members. We operate across six sites uh, from Barcelona, Grenoble, Hamburg, Heidelberg, uh, Hingston and Rome, where I'm actually located. Uh, so I'm, I'm the head of my cross uh, at EMBL Rome. In particular, Imbo Rome was established in 1999, so that was actually we celebrated our sort of 20th anniversary a couple of day, uh, years ago when I joined. We are focused on neurobiology and epigenetics, and that means that actually 95% of the imaging that we do is on tissue, right? So thick, uh, highly aberrant um, uh, sort of uh, samples. We have about eight to 10 groups where we aim actually extending over the next few years. We have about we have a sort of relatively low number of uh, internal users. We also have lots of number of collaboration. So this is sort of this is EMBL Rome. Um, EMBL as a whole has over 500 uh, external users yearly, and uh, EMBL Heidelberg has actually just uh, finished the construction of the new um, imaging center, uh, the place uh, to really um, host high state um, of the art imaging in the light and the EM, um, uh, electron microscopy. So what we do uh, in particular in Rome, so we have interest in uh, visualization of mineral activity. Um, so we do a lot of functional imaging, um, both in uh, head fixed animals, as well as in freely behaving and also anything on miniaturization uh, we're, we're interested. Uh, because we do most of our imaging on tissue, right? So anything that improves imaging, right? Uh, for tissue imaging, we're, we want to know about it. Uh, whether it be two photon, uh, lifetime. Um, I'm interested as well into how to automate complex microscopy flows, uh, workflows, uh, such as adaptive feedback, how we integrate things in general. And that's, that's, I, I will touch uh, upon this uh, in the next slide again. Um, I am convinced since I started that we should have essentially adaptive optics on every microscope. And I hope that uh, those of you from face form, face six, uh, imagine optics and dynamic optics agree with me. In terms of some of the key uh, sort of uh, multi-experiment pipelines that we're building, um, you may have heard there's a big boom on what is called the spatial omics. Um, and so we are interested in, in some of those things, in particular, what is called spatial transcriptomics, where you, you uh, profile the gene expression inside the tissue um, in situ, right? And, and so we actually uh, are attempting to deploy some of those techniques to implement them. Uh, but me as a facility, I'm interested as well in how we could automate and um, uh, scale up uh, some of those platforms. Um, this is because the, the technology is very low throughput, so you have to put a sample on the microscope and that will go for you know, a couple of days. Um, and so maybe there are ways to parallelize things and to increase throughput. And these has a massively big potential market for diagnostics. Um, so if anyone's interested, I will be keen on, on, on talking on, on that. Um, uh, beyond that, so we have also uh, spatial proteomic profiling, single molecule localizations. Um, and, and so this is this is essentially where problems lie. Uh, what I can what can I offer? And uh, I actually wanted to make the point what the facility workers in my, my facility can do for others, but um, as well a, a sort of a general uh, point of what a facility can do for for uh, for companies, right? So we are um, let's say facilities in general. We have this testing ground for real world deployment, right? So. Um, I've, I've heard, you know, I've, I've talked to some companies who say, well, we have a great cheap, we have a great lens. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, but I, I, I won't implement a single lens on a, an existing system. So we really have to sort of work together to try to 
integrated into uh, uh, let's say existing or uh, newer systems. Um, how, how do we actually uh, bring it to the large number of users that will benefit from, from those advances? Um, we can offer obviously testing over a large variety of samples, which means we can assist uh, you for production of application nodes. Um, and more importantly for you, uh, I guess, is we, we can provide you feedback, right? Um, in terms of how easy it is to use the technique, uh, whether it's something in terms of the technical specification needs to be changed, how we integrate it, right? And so uh, going back to what I, what I said before, um, so some, you know, some cheap, some lenses, some individual lasers, they might have a control software, that's great. But if I cannot integrate it into an existing system, there's no way I'm gonna use it. And there's no way that the, the, you know, the large, um users right and so if 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 i sort of really say that um so embl has about uh 500 external users per year right and so that's 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 your that's your market right so if someone um sort of comes and says oh you know i actually uh go to use that laser that lens um and that works fantastic then they're going to push for that technology to be adopted in their own places uh so integration is a, is a key thing and and you know we are we are here to really sort of provide that testing ground um, for uh, for novel solutions. And I think I was I was in time. And with that, I would like to take any questions. The first thing is that I am eternally grateful for you to come to this meeting and uh, looking for partnerships. This is what makes my life special. We have a lot of partnerships here to explore. There is a passion that you and me share which is wavefront sensors and adaptive optics. I want to have a, a little bit of a round to see how we can start something together on this field. I have some of the key companies in Europe in the room with you today. Uh, actually, one of them is called FASIX. And I think I believe that we have Julu with us today. You, are you with us? Yeah, yeah, uh, thank you. So we are looking for partnerships on adaptive optics. Uh, please tell us what you do and then maybe we can start some kind of cooperation here. Okay, that's great. I will try to share my screen. So uh, actually, uh, my company physics is all working on the um, optical metrology solutions, uh, pro more precisely in uh, microscopy. Uh, we work on the plug and play quantitative phase imaging system so based on our uh, patented technology, which is called uh, Hydrogen wave uh, lateral sharing uh, interferometry. Uh, so we, what we do, we modify uh, existing camera by adding a uh, diffractive plating in front of the sensor. And after that, uh, we plug this camera on, on, on a standard microscope. Uh, then uh, the, the beam under test will be uh, uh, generate the interference patterns. And then we can calculate the phase and got the phase image of the, through, this, uh, the, through this camera. Uh, so actually, uh, we are working on different applications in microscopy. Uh, for the biologist, um, we can get the uh, contra uh, contrast uh, enhanced image and the label-free image by using uh, this kind of camera. And also for the materials uh, research, we can get the measure the refractive index uh, vibration. Uh, it's very useful for the waveguides and uh, meta surface characterizations. Uh, so here are the different uh, products we have. So you can uh, have a three different kind of products. So with a compact ICD4 HR or, or a high performance uh, ICD4 SA8, which is based on a SCMOS camera. And uh, more than that, you can have some uh, customized uh, optical system called the Seed4 Elements that you can combined with your own camera, uh, no matter it's uh, EMCCD or high-speed cameras, uh, to transform your, your own camera to a uh, quantitative phase images. So that so will be all for we address <laughs> a short the introduction. Way. And uh, yeah, if you anyone uh, is interested by this kind of a uh, technique and uh, uh, we are all interested uh, you, that's why yeah. we are here. Uh, I want to address <laughs> the quadri-wave lateral share, uh, sharing interferometry, Alvaro, after we go to another one slide that you want, I want you to huh? see, because I'm very interested about this. We have face form. We have a mm -hmm. face form in the room, Stefan Weber. Stefan, good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, yes, I'm, so I'm this is the best time for you to speak. We just had, oh. had a company, uh, EMVL, looking for partnerships in adaptive optics. How can you help? 
Yes, it's actually uh, great to hear because we, we're trying to, I wouldn't say reinvent the wheel, but go a, a quite new and different way of performing adaptive optics, which is uh, different from the, the mirrors, you know, that if you all kind of, um, let's say, uh, system um, complexities in, in integrating in that into microscopy, and we have something that is lens-like, but is still high resolution that we call a deformable faceplate, you have uh, electrodes in line and they deform a membrane. And with that, you can change the, the optical pass difference or, or the phase. So we already tried that um, in, in microscopy and it, it shows a uh, great promise. And uh, we'll actually a, a spin off from the University of Freiburg and we're gonna commercialize this in the coming months. And uh, we're very happy to receive any uh, interest that um, wants to actually integrate that into their uh, microscopy systems. Thank you very much, Ste uh, Stefan. I'm going back to Alvaro. Alvaro, when you talk about the use of adaptive optics, you were always talking about large area sensing. Uh, what, what kind of area are you targeting? And also, do you spot some kind of room for cooperation with the two companies who just told you what they do? Uh, absolutely. So, uh... Do I spot a room for cooperation? Absolutely. Um, so uh, I have to say that sort of my background in, in you see the theoretical background in adaptive optics is, is relatively uh, new. Um, and uh, there was a, a adaptive optics summer school organized uh, a couple of weeks ago by Martin Booth. Um, and it, it was actually quite interesting. Um, so I've, I've been in contact with, with a couple of companies um, at the end of the day, the point is, let's say for uh, let's say for spinning this confocal, is that there is no there is no easy solution, right? So if we can if, if I can help you make that, um, I would be very interested. Um, there is no there is no way at this very moment that I can obtain the, sort of the perfect stack, right? So we we've all talked about you know confocal scanning or spinning disc. Um, that's more or less what we do for sectioning. Um, uh, with the uh, exception of when you work with uh, light sheet, um, but you know if you if you just want to take a, your your standard scanning confocal and you want to get the perfect uh, 3D stack, right? With every plane has uh, uh, a sort of um, corrected um, uh, aberrations um, as you go over, let's say, 50 or 100 microns of thick tissue. Um, there is no such a thing. And I would love to see that, right? And every user in my facility would love to see that. Um, I, you know yeah. what I love to see? More, more femtosecond laser companies of Epic doing research with you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move now from Adafi Optics to femtosecond lasers. Because you talk a lot about two photon. You talk a, lot, you talk a little bit about three photon. I want you to talk a little bit more about that. But before that, we have a company from Poland and one from Lithuania, who I think there is some clear room for cooperation here with you. Let's go first to Poland. Darius Cesz, CEO of Fluence. Oh. Hi, hi, Jose. Thank you very much. So yes, I was very excited to, to see this uh, recent slides from EMBL because I see you like compact, you like small, and so do we. So uh, I just I just show you a couple of slides uh, of what what we have. So uh, we are a laser company from Poland very unique thing we have we we like doing all fiber lasers and we like doing them small so we have this perfect solution for multi photon microscopy uh, the laser is called halide so it is very small uh, one box solution all electronics integrated inside uh, of, a, of a very compact construction. And the most beautiful, th beautiful thing about halide is that it is a monolithic OPM fiber laser. So it's very robust and very, uh, very reliable laser. Um, and of course, uh, this is only one thing because something we do very special as well is that we operate this laser at lower repetition rate of 20 megahertz. Many people, they are scared hearing about 20 megahertz, but this is why we are here showing you the slides to, to show you that this brings actually some advantage. So you can see here on the slide, comparison between 80 megahertz titanium sapphire laser and 20 megahertz uh, halide laser. And what, what you can see straight away that having the same average power 
and the different rep rates, you can obtain much better results because you get four times higher energy per pulse having the same average power, right? So, uh, so uh, we, we did this test like in many, uh, well, for different measurements, uh, all, uh, it, it, it's all the same result that you get like better, better, um, better images. And if you want to, uh, well, learn more about the laser, just visit our website or I will be also happy to, to tell you more. So I, uh, thank you very much. Alvaro, this is one of the ones to watch in Europe right now. This is 150 femtoseconds, as stable as it gets with 20 megahertz. But uh, before I, I give you the floor, because I want to talk about a bit of Fleeman to Photon, I want you to meet my friends from Light Conversion. Lucas Contenis, good afternoon. A show good, for being here. Good afternoon again. So let me, let me share my screen. I have a couple of slides to show as well. Should be good now. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so light conversion. Yes, uh, we we make uh, lasers, OPAs, OPOs. Um, also, a very big uh, OPCPA system. So, facility grade, large few cycle systems, and uh, um, also uh, transient uh, absorption spectrometers, which I guess is not the topic today, which is a little bit shame because I really like that. But uh, so we also make. Um, um, lasers that are going to be really of interest to, to this uh, microscopy topic here. So hearing what everybody else says, I was about to say something like small and, and a small footprint and compact, but I guess this is really not the case uh, compared to, to other systems. So let's say we are going into a, a different direction. Uh, so very high performance, or let's say the cutting edge uh, parameter space rather than, than being very compact. So uh, two systems I really want to show you today uh, are the, um, is the Cronus OPO, uh, which is a three-channel simultaneous output uh, solid state uh, OPO, and then a Cronus uh, 3P, which is a uh, even lower repetition rate, actually, to what was mentioned, a two megahertz or up to two megahertz uh, OPA that works in the shortwave infrared, so 1.3 to 1.7 microns. And... Um, so really this, the, the idea here, or, or the, the, the split here, is that the OPO is, is good for fast imaging. Um, and because you have, uh, so it, it's, it works at a traditional 80 megahertz repetition rate. So get your 160 femtoseconds, three outputs. And because they're optically synchronized, you can use the multiple beams either for multiple fluorescence excitations or for coherent Raman interactions because you have essentially three lasers in one box. So really that's sort of one side of the story. Now, I guess uh, um, um, if you, uh, so for, for uh, applications that uh, are more interested in uh, deep imaging rather than fast imaging, uh, you need uh, lower repetition rates as was just shown. And uh, uh, you also need to move into the infrared so that you could penetrate deeper into uh, scattering tissues. Uh, I was hearing that that was also a, a problem that, that people are facing. So for, for that, you need a, um, a, a Cronus 3P, which is uh, um, which is uh, covers the biolog biological transparency windows at 1.3 and 1.7 microns. Uh, the pulse duration can go down to 50 femtoseconds, and uh, you can get micro up to micro gel, micro joule level pulses with with the system. So uh, compare everything uh, combined together, you can get excitations, uh, ex good nonlinear excitation down to millimeter and beyond. So, Achoo, Lucas, and I, yeah. I want to, sorry for this, but we need, to, okay. we need to get the, 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 the feeling from Alvaro. Alvaro, one more thing. If you're looking for even shorter pulses, 20, 40 femtoseconds, Oliver from Valo Innovation also in the room. Oliver, complete the story from, from Fluence of Light Conversion here. Yeah, hi together. Um, so I, I have not prepared a slide, um, but uh, Valo Innovation is, is doing very short pulse fiber lasers uh, with down to 30 femtoseconds. Uh, and with integrated dispersion compensation modules. And I think uh, these very short parts can increase your two photon efficiency uh, yeah, ver ver to very good values. And um, so if you're interested in, in having more information or just to talk about these very short parts uh, lasers, um, yeah, we can come into discussion. Uh, as you can see, Alvaro, we are all super interested at uh, starting collaboration with ultra fast lasers. You talk a little bit about the, the two photo microscopy, you talk a little bit about FLIM, 
you maybe talk a little bit about three photon. Can you tell us, uh, can you give us a bit of meat on the roadmap of EMBL on, on these technologies? Sure, that, that's a bit of a loaded question. Um, so I cannot tell you all the what, what's in the future because uh, so we, I guess we as humans, we are terrible at predicting what, what's to come. But I can tell you what I'm doing um, and so where I want to take at least my facility. So um, we do not have in this very moment a two photon system, uh, nor a three photon, nor flint, right? And so I'm, I'm really essentially looking for what's out there, you know, how can we build the best possible system at the moment? How can we drive the technology forward? How can we integrate what's uh, sort of the possible innovations um, uh, that exist, right? So in terms of the uh, lasers that I heard, uh, the immediate question what I, that I would have is, uh, do I have a sync pulse out, right? Could I use that um, to, uh, um, as a synchronizer for FLIM? Uh, maybe well, that I, I couple that with a with an ec another detector, um, you know. Um. Who, who can answer that? Is there room for cooperation to use the femtosecond laser for synchronization of FLIM? I'm looking at Darius, I'm looking at Oliver, I'm looking at Lucas, I'm even looking at Toptica as well on this because I know, uh, do you know my friend from Toptica? Tita, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. I know there's an experiment on that from a Toptica paper, actually. Yes, we are, um, we are in FLIM. That's not my speciality, but uh, we for sure um, provide the solution um, that he's asking of to synchronize the pulses. So we, we're kind of the specialist in synchronizing pulses. You can kind of choose any duration between pulses and yeah. It works quite good. Also, also, I have lithium lasers in the room that are also quite experts on that. Do you want to say hello, Alessandro? Hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, in terms of synchronization of pulses, uh, if the matter is to, to, to synchronize the, the, the repetition rate of the laser, a very, very fine tuning of the repetition rate of the laser, we can do that. And we can provide a femtosecond laser at a very high average power, around one microns, uh, ranging from 950 nanometers up to 1200 nanometers with a special broadband uh, uh, module option. So I would be glad to, to have the chance to talk with Alvaro also directly. So I would like to say something, Alvaro. Uh, I have a deal that is when an r and project can start, I pay for the shipping expenses of the laser. Some of the lasers that have been presented are big, I don't mind. I still pay for them. And if I have to, I will drive from Warsaw all the way to Italy with the laser. So I would like to say, please, Alvaro, there's going to be a lot of introductions because the challenges you have in adaptive optics and synchronization of FLIM are something that we excel in. Uh, I hope that we can start some good R&D cooperations here. Alvaro, grazie mille. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome. And everyone, you know, all, all, loads, all, all roads lead to Rome, so everyone's welcome. And we We're stay very close. In... We are as well. <laughs> we, stay, we stay in Italy and we go from one of the leading R&D centers in microscopy in the world. We are talking about the Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia. What a beautiful name. Giuseppe Vicidomini, thank you very much, principal investigator at IET. There is a lot of room for cooperation with you. You told us our challenges. We are very excited about what's coming. Giuseppe, the so, floor is yours. Good, good afternoon to everybody and thanks a lot for the really warm introduction. I'm going to share my, my, my screen. Okay. Can you see? Yeah, not yet in slideshow mode. Now okay, yes. now yes. it's in, in uh, okay, so perfect. So again, thanks a lot for this, this invitation. It's amazing for me to be, to be here and to talk with uh, all this, this company. So I'm approaching a little bit from the uh, research point of view, the topic of today. So, okay, as, um, as has been mentioned, I'm a principal investigator at the Molecular Microscopy and Spectroscopy Lab at the Italian Institute of Technology, but I am also co-founder and scientific advisor of uh, Genoa Instrument, a startup of the Italian Institute of Technology. So, and today what I would like to do, I would like to demonstrate to you, I would like to show you how a single a photon detector array and particular SPAD array can revolutionize uh, fluorescent laser scanning microscopy. So, uh, but before let me introduce, let's say a few words about us. So we are a relatively small group composed mainly by physicists and engineers. 
largely supported by the by the European community, as you can see, and uh, and collaborate with many big group in microscopy, like the group of Professor Alberto Diaspora that I'm sure that you know. Uh, but not only group in microscopy, also group in uh, working in development of photonic devices, such as the group of uh, uh, Professor Alberto Tozzi. So what we do, so which is our aim, which is our real goal? So the core research of uh, our lab is to design, develop, and validate. So we want to cover all the pipeline. Uh, we want to develop novel optical and analytical tool that allow the modern biologists, so biologists change a lot in this day, uh, to observe biomol biomolecular processes inside the living biological system, such as, uh, in principle, live cell or even uh, relatively small uh, animal. So uh, with what, what, when we want to observe such a, such a process, what we want to achieve? We want to achieve the best, the uh, better uh, temporary spatial ability. So I'm talking about spatial resolution, temporary resolution, spatial range, how deep I can go, how large can be my sample, and temporal range, how long I can collect my sample. And even more, what I want to do, I want to have a lot of data. I want to have uh, a massive information content by my measurement. So in particular, as a group, we strongly believe that the microscopy does not provide us only pretty nice images, but provide real data. So we need data. I'm happy that Alvaro introduced about genomics and all this, the, the revolution that is going on. These are data. Um, so, um, and today what I would like to do, I would like to take this minute to show you uh, one specific task, one specific topic. So how we try to achieve this goal that I told you as, uh, that we have as a lab in the context of uh, fluorescent laser scanning microscopy. So this project came out from the fact that we, we, we believe that uh, in, a, in any laser scanning microscope, in any conventional and modern laser scanning microscope, there is a fundamental limitation. So in particular that during the uh, image formation process, there is a lot, of, a lot of information are lost. So let me try to convince you about this, this problem. So and, uh, in a nutshell, I would like to describe really uh, fast how it works uh, a laser scanning microscope, a fluorescent laser scanning microscope. So basically what you do, you take a laser, the excitation laser, and you use the objective lens to focus so your uh, laser into your sample, generating a typically diffraction limited spot that we call the probing region. All the molecule, all the fluorescent molecule emit inside this probing region emit light that is collected by, back by the objective lens and thanks to a tube lens is focused on the image plane. Okay, so you have an image here. But then what happened? Typically I use a photomultiplier or anyway a single element detector that integrates all this light across space and also across time, because during the pixel dual time, I integrate the light and I obtain a single intensity value. I have an image that changes in time, but I obtain a single intensity value. Then what I do, I scan my probe, uh, my probing region across the sample uh, to obtain uh, one value for each position, and then I build up my images. But it's clear that since I'm integrating both across time and across space, all the photons that, that are coming from my, my probing region, I'm losing information. Okay, so for me, for us, this was clear. But the problem was that there was no device able to uh, remove this problem. So to do that, what we do, we start collaborating with the Polytechnic of Milan that are really good in developing a detector array and in particular single photon detector array. And we developed what in our opinion was the first detect single photon detector array able to remove this problem, able to give access to this new spatial and temporal information without losing any other property of our uh, scanning microscope, or our confocal microscope, our two-photon excitation microscope, our step microscope. So when we got this, uh, so I'm, I would not want to waste time too much into the performance of this detector, because this is growing so much and so fast, but two aspects are really important. First, that's a very small detector array. It's only five by five uh, uh, pixel, really small, but big enough to sampling the probe region with the Nyquist criteria but small enough to transfer the data photon by photon to implement an asynchronous readout uh, system. So I collect photon by one, one by one. That's very important. So we are moving into the area of single photon microscopy. So the other very important property is that I can collect this photon with a temporal stamp and with a precision, in this case, that's an old uh, slide with an old uh, SPAD array, single photon average array, with a precision of 200 picoseconds. So well below many photophysical uh, phenomena of my probe. So for example, I can measure the, the fluorescent lifetime like Alvaro before was, was mentioned. 
So now that I have this tool, this new toy for us, because we are a lab that develops microscopy technique, what we do, we introduce in our laser scanning microscope, and we immediately realize that it can be beneficial for all the characteristics, all the performance of our system. For a question of time, I will just explore, I will just explain two of them, but since we talk about uh, it is possible to use for adaptive optics uh, as a sort of wavefront sensor, it is possible to, to use with two photon excitation microscopy, it is possible to, to use to investigate dynamics, fast dynamics by first correlation spectroscopy. But let me focus on only two, only two, um, uh, two projects. So the first project used the, 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 this new special uh, information that can be achieved only with the, our uh, single photo detector array to build up uh, some sub diffraction spatial resolution images, some super resolved images. So when we have this detector inside the microscope, what do we have? We can have an image for each position of the probing uh, region, for each position of my laser inside my sample. Or alternative, we can simply see that after the scanning, we get access to 25 images of the same sample at the same time, but from a slightly different point of view. It's a sort of tomographic uh, view of my sample. When I have these 25 images, I can apply some reconstruction, really easy reconstruction, also computationally very, very low, and without any, uh, any uh, let's say, input from the user, I can build up a super resolved image, a sub diffraction resolved image. Here is just an example of four different subcellular structures of my sample. So tubulin, actin, chromotrin, and nuclear pore complex. As you can see, the resolution uh, increased drastically. But very important, there is no difference from the user when he's sitting in front of a conventional microscope to a confocal microscope, or when he's sitting in front of what we call image scanning microscope. So the second, oh, yeah, that's another example because we, you talk a lot about two-photon excitation, that clearly can be combined with two-photon excitation, and that's the answer that you get in resolution when you compare with, for example, non-descanning uh, non -descanning system. That, uh, unfortunately, is pretty good for some aspects, but it's really poor in resolution. So the second project that I want to talk to you about is exploring the second, the, the, both the spatial ability of the detector to tag this photon in a particular position of my uh, image plane, but also the, uh, the temporal uh, aspect of this detector. So to, uh, the ability to, to collect this photon with this very high uh, temporal resolution. So we take these two information, we fuse together, and now we are able to combine super resolution to achieve high resolution image with fluorescent lifetime imaging, which is nowadays it's a very hot topic in the context of uh, life science. So and in particular for the life science imaging community. So, but there was a big problem. There was a big challenge at the time when we approached this project is the fact that uh, doesn't exist a data, a data acquisition system able to collect such kind of data because every detector, every element of my detector array is firing a digital signal every time that the photon arrives to the detector and they have to take this signal and put a, a sort of, of a temporal tag with a very high precision. So at that time doesn't exist such a card, so we decided to develop by ourselves and we take advantage of the FPGA technology, another big revolution in, in, our, in our field. And uh, thanks to this uh, uh, FPGA development kit, which costs really 2,000 euro, we, 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 we obtain a multi-channel uh, multi type tagging platform with 30 picosecond precision, much higher, than the, the, much higher than the resolution of the detector, with uh, uh, fast prototyping, because we are using an FPGA, low cost and ready to do, and large scalability. So we would like to take this one as a sort of platform to improve every time that we need. So, and I'm happy to say that we are going to release this uh, uh, this platform as an open source is this part of a, an European an European project. Um, um, again, when uh, uh, I will want to show you some examples, for example, here. Um, that's an example in which we use our new platform for functional imaging. So, and in particular, what we do, we make imaging of a live cell labeled with a polarity sensitive membrane probe, was fluorescent lifetime is an indicator of the order of the lipid membrane. So if, if we compare conventional imaging, the top row with, the, with, the, with the, our uh, super resolved forest light type imaging on the bottom row, you can see that the resolution become higher, but what is very important is that we have higher precision in the estimate of the fluorescent light time. So for example, in this case, it's much easier to reveal the, the membrane that has an ordered liquid phase compared to the, the membrane of the vesicle that has a disordered phase. 
Um, another very important aspect that's also for con conventional imaging is that now we can, thanks to this detector and the sensitivity of the detector, we can make imaging with nanovac illumination power. So that's perfect for lifestyle imaging, so for long-term imaging. And uh, again, another important aspect that we are not removing any characteristic of our, uh, of our conventional microscope with a single element detector, but we are adding characteristic, we are adding ability. No, we don't have to change our protocol for the sample preparation. That's very important for people working in the field of life science. They do not want to change how they prepare the sample. And this is the case. And this is not the case. So uh, let's say in conclusion, I, I, I hope that I'm, I was able to convince you that there is no any more any excuse, there is no any more technical limitation to transform our conventional microscope in a single photon microscope. So a microscope that, at least for the laser scanning microscopy, a microscope that is able to collect photon one by one, tag it then with a spatial and temporal tag, and then analyze the data to achieve the best, the best result and the best information from your cell. So, I think that now we are ready for the era of single photon microscopy. What next? So a photon can be characterized by many property, not only a temporal tag, a special tag, but for example, I can add also some wavelength tag about the spectrum of the photon or a polarization tag. So ideally, I would like to achieve the information at the single molecule level and then analyze this, this kind of information. So, but so clearly there are some uh, steps that have to be done in terms of technology. For example, here I report some, uh, let's say, need that will be nice to feel. First of all, the detector uh, needs to be improved. So it will be nice to always increase the efficiency, the fill factor or other properties that are very important to maximize the flux from your, from, your, from your sample and even to reduce the light dose, for example. Having good uh, dark system, so we are collecting photon by photon, a lot of information. We have to store such information, we have to analyze this information. And then obviously laser is another very important property. So cheap super continual parts, super continual laser are, are fantastic for, this, for the, this kind of system. And obviously also adaptive optic system because I didn't have time to show you, but that's the perfect system to uh, understand the aberration. It's a perfect detector to realize the aberration in your sample. So I hope that I was able to convince you and uh, happy to receive your, your, your question. And I hope that uh, both as a research uh, lab uh, at IT, but also as a startup, we can together work on this new challenge. Thank you very much, Giuseppe, for being with us. And the first thing I want to ask you is I want to ask you for a favor, because I'm going to assume we're going to start traveling again. I'm a huge fan of IIT. So can I come to visit you and you can give me a tour of the labs? Sure, sure. Now we, Do you we mind if I bring my 700 friends? <laughs> okay, yeah, we, 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 we just recently expand in terms of space, so why not? Uh, I think that it fit. We have to, to locate a little bit all around Genoa, but, uh, but that's okay. <laughs> M Michelle, Lucas, Oliver, Darius, we are, going, we are going to visit IIT. Giuseppe, a few questions for you. The first one is coming from me. Uh, today you presented uh, flim, well, FLISM, and yeah. um, it was not clear to me what is the challenge. What is the, the, the main challenge that my friends can help you with? Okay, so there is one, uh, let's say, one channel that is from the computational point of view, but maybe that's not the, the, the best scenario we have to talk about. But uh, the other big, uh, big uh, chance is that we receive a lot of photons from, from, from the sample, and we have to collect this photon. And we need electronics able to collect this photon and store this photon in a very fast way. So here I know that there are a lot of people working in time correlated single photon counting, and I'm sure that's what I'm talking about. Uh, other challenge, it's clear that the detector, as I told you, uh, this detector, the first detector was developed in 2017, 2018, was a really a prototype. I show you a picture about it. And, uh, but the, the route, the, the path, uh, the path, the path to, to a real product uh, is still, there is still something to do. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, can be much better efficiency, uh, lower dark noise and so on. So we are working in this direction, but I'm sure that uh, uh, help from other people can be fundamental. The second question is coming from our new Epic BFF, Alvaro from EMBL. What's on your mind? <laughs> Uh, thanks. Uh, what did I say? So I asked you, uh, there were two questions, a practical one and a more, I guess, uh, uh, theoretical one. So the practical one is, can we try the array? Is yeah, it available? Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm, 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 I, I received this question so many times and that's the first uh, conference, workshop, uh, meeting that I can say yes. So 
I mean, please uh, send us an email uh, okay. uh, and we can arrange uh, how, to, how, to, how to test this detector. So definitely, but the answer is yes. Oh, cool, cool. Um, and the other one is, do you think that uh, these sort of single photon microscopy could be uh, implemented in a light sheet format? Uh, and I have in mind, let's say, an open top light sheet that will be uh, great for like sort of generic imaging. I'm. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I know group, and there is one uh, one guy also here at, the, at, the, um, at this meeting that are working for real camera with a single photon ability. Uh, our lab is not really uh, on that, so that's the reason why we. we I focus this talk on 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 laser scanning microscopy, where a five by five uh, um, uh, camera is enough, because uh, five by five you transfer really a lot of data. Think about if you have a mega frame camera, so. Maybe you can, but then the challenge will be, oh, now I have all this data, <laughs> how I can manage it. So, but definitely that's, that's something that people are working on. And I think that in the, the future for me, it's, uh, it's about single photon. So that's clearly uh, uh, the future of, my cross, of, of microscopy, at least for fluorescent and microscopy. The present, so. the present is single photon. You said it very well. We are now ready for the era of single photon microscopy. I'm quoting you on that, Giuseppe. We go from top around the center IIT, from top around the center uh, University of Southampton. I think there is clear room for cooperation here. Samit, what's on your mind? Hello, thank you. Uh, it was a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it, uh, Giuseppe, actually. Uh, so I was wondering, I had similar question as Alvaro actually for light sheet microscopy, but uh, I have another question regarding your DAC development. I think you're absolutely right that uh, for, for, uh, for data acquisition cards, there's sufficient scope for improvement because they're rarely made for microscopy. Uh, so uh, because of your, because you're, uh, you are, you are, I mean, uh, as if I understood it correctly, you're fabricating for, uh, for single photon microscopy, I guess they will need to be very fast, which is why they're based on FPGA yeah. uh, technology, which means that possibly they can also help with the conventional imaging to increase sensitivity. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, having access to this FPGA, I feel that uh, it's again a, a big revolution for, for, for our group and for group in microscopy, because uh, I mean, you can really test something day by day. So you can develop your data acquisition in, in a couple of weeks, I mean, maybe a little bit less, and then test immediately. So there is no, uh, let's say a sort of, uh, uh, yeah, you know, if you, want to have the, if you want to build up a PCB, you need time and so on. So uh, definitely it's good regarding the, the, the fact that can be used uh, um, uh, for improving the, let's say the, the, the flux of photon and the speed. Now we are going to very, very fast. We, we for example, we acquire at uh, 240, megahertz so and we have we can go much farther so the beauty of uh, try to release also these uh, data acquisitions uh, as an open source is because uh, people like you or people that as a, a group like my one can really try to uh, up to, uh, put something on the top and achieve maybe the, what the, what they really need yeah so anybody wants to try your components Giuseppe and that's great I want this to happen a lot. So I really want, once again, I'm coming to visit Giuseppe. Whoever wants to come with me, I will let you know when, and we all go together to have dinner in Italy. I can't, I can't wait for that. But I have another comment here, which is coming from my epic expert on biotech, Dr. Elena Veletkaya. What's on your mind? Thank you, Jose, and thank you, Giuseppe, and I'm definitely joining on the tour because I want to see all of that and all those fantastic images. But something which I perhaps uh, missed, uh, but uh, really and, and drives all my um, biology uh, curiosity, the imaging, the single photon imaging you are showing and super resolution images, uh, you say there is no change of protocol. Does it mean that it still can be done only on fixed samples or you can actually do it on non-fixed samples? No, well? I mean, the, 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 well, uh, unfortunately, I cannot show movie. At, at least that's what, what I heard. But uh, for example, the, the lifetime imaging has been done in, in lifestyle imaging. So um, that's one other very, very important property of this uh, new technology is that you can uh, reduce a lot the illumination uh, that you need to observe your sample. So that's specific design for lifestyle imaging. So you can use fixed sample, really, that's not a problem. You can, 
but but this is designed for lifestyle imaging. So you can use protein, fluorescent protein. You can use organic fluorophore. You can use all the protocol that you already use for conventional imaging. So. And can yeah. you then also move even further imaging the tissue, not just the cells? Yeah, the, 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 the two photon uh, image that I show you is a brain tissue. We make okay. imaging up to 500 micro, um, micrometer. Um, that was a two photon uh, system. So clearly for deep imaging will be nice. It's much better to work on with two photon excitation rather than single photon excitation. So you Thank really you. add uh, uh, um, new feature, new characteristic on top of the, the one that you already have before. So you don't remove all these other characteristics. Thank you so much, Giuseppe. And I would like to say that in a meeting with Unity, with EMBL and with IIT, I can't think of anyone better in the whole world to close this meeting than the company who started the microscopy activity at Epic. And that is Opto, Marcus Riedel the CEO of Opto or Success Story of Microscopy. I think there is a lot of room for cooperation with your presentation. You're going to see the overlap now, everyone. The floor is yours, Marcus. Hello. Thanks for getting me the chance uh, uh, to uh, finally uh, uh, make a presentation about uh, a summary. Uh, do you see my presentation now? Uh, yes. Is it running? Perfectly. Perfectly. Okay. So uh, we heard very much about uh, uh, scientific approaches uh, and so on. So I see myself here more as an exotic uh, uh, guy, uh, even if we are in microscopy for more than 40 years. But I heard many, many uh, things that are really touching us here. That means uh, real-time microscopy, artificial intelligence, compact integration, pollen set stacking, integration into existing instruments, that's exactly what Opto is for. Okay, so uh, we are the guys uh, in the way about uh, digitalizing microscopy, automating microscopy. Today, I want to put a little bit of an, an, an eye on uh, PCR screening, uh, point of care testing. Uh, a bottleneck in saying, okay, microscopy becomes a commodity item uh, like these phones is to make it compact, to make it affordable. Huh? So our chance was in saying, okay, this is a microscope. This is the microscope of the future. Okay, so uh, it's not by by accident that uh, they both uh, look quite uh, similar. So the idea is to have uh, machine builders and system integrators who are doing these screening machines and serve them with imaging modules. Imaging modules is everything about imaging. So. We are the guys making the bridge between microscopy and what we call machine vision. What is a typical machine vision? Machine vision is more about speed. It's more about uh, interpreting um, microscopes also as sensors. And that's the target what we are doing. So all these technologies that we have heard is, so to say, on our roadmap over the next years to integrate it based on our platform that we developed over the last six, uh, even ten years. Uh, to bring it to the market as a sensor. But you can uh, imagine if you want to position yourself, you have the Leica size Nikon Olympus on the one side, you have Keynes on the other side, and companies like SIC uh, who are making sensors, and we want to see ourselves in the middle in concentrating microscopy as sensors, and then on the other hand, really doing software, doing artificial intelligence. Because we are believing that microscopy uh, and about the data that we are creating with these uh, uh, image uh, sensors principally uh, is enabling us uh, to analyze, to classify images, to classify uh, uh, these informations that we're getting out of these microscopes to get better results, to really improve uh, what we at the moment call resolution or we call information uh, all the day about uh, predictive diagnostics uh, uh, getting more information. So we are saying, okay, we are taking care about image data management. Uh, so from the image acquisition to the processing, uh, to the really uh, detecting and, 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 and analyzing. So speed, high throughput, that's, that's that what we are doing. And uh, uh, one thing is uh, uh, every time when you are thinking about speed, uh, one determined uh, uh, aspect is always moving parts. Uh, 
Uh, so when we are building into machineries, when we're calling about sensors, we don't want to move parts. We don't want to have a focus. We don't want to have, uh, so to say, changing filter wheels, uh, changing conditions. Uh, big data, uh, data analysis is always based on really reliability on, on images. And when we call about uh, fluorescence, so our thinking and that means uh, the next generation imaging modules that will come on the market, for example, is all about targeting of multifluorescence. Uh, so this will be, so to say, uh, a product uh, that incubates two light sources, uh, the filters that you can change two fluorescences in milliseconds. Uh, to an affordable price, an affordable price, I mean under 10K in a, in a, in a list pricing. Uh, so based on Geek E, five megapixel sensors, so the real uh, new technology. So uh, at that moment, we are very much in touch with all these microfluidic uh, electrophoresis applications that are popping up, that coming out of this lab environment on the left side and want to automate. Uh, so they want uh, uh, quick images, uh, they want really speedy and uh, what we are building and what is coming up uh, in the next things are really uh, handheld uh, uh, these devices that's an inverted microscope. So we have a condenser inside, uh, you have a microscope on the one side but doing one application. But uh, if you buy a, a big size microscope you can afford of about 10 or 15 of these microscopes. Uh -huh. So think about that, uh, think about uh, really imaging uh, the stacks where they are and so on. And this uh, leads then principally, uh, now you see the video, uh, we are implementing uh, CMOS sensors and when you have microfluidic, uh, you can really uh, change between, uh, for example, a quantitative PCR where you are counting blobs, where you're counting a fluorescent response uh, on a big field of view or you make digital. Uh -huh. So, and here we wrote software uh, with Bob analysis where we are analyzing. So, say so this were pollen here, for example. So, it's many hundred frames per second that we are doing here, and we're doing for each pollen about six images. And what are we doing with this? So, uh, we are uh, the opinion about uh, putting, so to say, the morphology uh, of cells, of pollen, of, of, of everything to in account to, to evaluate. So, this idea is coming out of the IVF market that we are also uh, quite familiar with, where the doctors want to see the embryo, the oocyte, uh, so to say, from different uh, aspects uh, to have the morphology inside. Now we had uh, a project here with pollen, where we also wrote classification, where we also uh, uh, put made the software to, to fuel it into uh, neural networks. Uh, and uh, I saw also another uh, application about pollen set stacking. So where you're going through the pollen, we are making it in, in uh, milliseconds. So you get one of these images for each pollen uh, in some milliseconds. So you get uh, your really data management uh, thing. So you get a three-dimensional uh, image or, or, or data set of about uh, hundreds of pollen per second. So that's, that's our challenge, uh, to really make this high throughput screening and therefore we develop their own light sources. So for example, we have a platform for multifluorescence imaging, so we make about 12 fluorescence in about 4 or 5 seconds. Uh, so with an XY platform that is implemented in uh, uh, screening machineries to then do uh, uh, images, we work in here together with the Leibniz EPHT. Uh, another specification when it's all about automation of microscopy is that we are moving the microscope, for example, especially when you have very specific uh, lab on a chip application where it's quite difficult uh, uh, to move your sample. So everything about uh, uh, robotics, uh, implementing it. Uh, so uh, the, the customers and, and uh, so to say the companies uh, we are dealing with uh, are from the one side from the industry where we were used to get very nice specifications. Uh, this should be the speed, uh, size, weight, uh, and so on. Uh, we are realized in, in, in the medical fields uh, we have to deal with doctors. We have to deal with uh, uh, biomaterial that they are doing. They have no idea about uh, a mechanical uh, aspects here. So it's more about interpreting these needs 
but the needs are uh, endless principally from lab automation uh, to uh, really uh, uh, high throughput screening applications. Uh, but at the end of the day, it has to be affordable. And we're speaking here about microscopic prices, about 3000 euros to 10 K. Uh, but then distributing them globally on a global chain. That's what we have uh, sort of say in mind. And again, so I removed here what can Epic help us. So uh, I put in the last uh, presentations always put microscopy more on the plate. That's what we are doing today. So thanks for this. Uh, but anyway, we want to be the glue between uh, photonics uh, and uh, machine vision. Every aspect about integrating uh, microscopy into machinery, automate machinery, automate microscopy, as well as image analysis on software. We have a huge software department coming out of the machine vision industry with specific know-how about microscopy. That's what we want to do. And uh, yeah, Jose, help us uh, uh, with this uh, to be recognized that this is what we want to be and do what you do. You do a great job. Thanks. Thank you so much, Marcus, for this fantastic presentation and even more for all the fantastic jobs that you're doing. So I think the message to Jose is now conveyed very well. So we, he will make sure and we as a whole team will make sure to make it very well known to not only all the EPIC network, but beyond that. But I still would like to come back to the question what the EPIC members can do for you. So do you have any many particular challenges you're still working on, whether it's on optics design or um, maybe some more and different light sources? So what are the other technical challenges you have? Uh, at the moment, the biggest challenge is uh, supply chain. <laughs> so uh, we are not getting components. Uh, so it's a big, big uh, difficulty to get uh, sensors on the market, to get electronic components. And if you want to range up, uh, uh, scale up, uh, like we want to do in hundreds of thousands, uh, that's a big challenge. A big challenge what we are fronting is, uh, and that may be where, where Epic really can help, is uh, the understanding about uh, the needs of microscopy in the medical field. Uh, so uh, they are used to, to uh, this really uh, big uh, multi-photon or, or single photon microscopy, fluorescence and so on. And then they're coming to me and they're saying, yeah, now I want it five times cheaper and I want it exactly this size, everything inside. So, that's not realistic okay so our challenge is is really uh, to have really unrealistic uh, demands when it's about automation when it's about screening and even this artificial intelligence uh, to 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 bring it into uh, the mindset of the people of the customers is, is really a challenge at that moment okay well that is a challenge which we as a whole epic community here can try to tackle but uh, before we go that way, let's see what other questions are there. So we have a question from Alvaro from EMBL. Alvaro, well, everybody knows you by now. I don't need to say where you're from, but um, nevertheless. Thanks. What do you uh, want to ask? Yeah, uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, that was a quite nice talk. Um, can you integrate fluidics as well? So if, uh, by any chance, I want to, let's say, uh, automate also some steps of sample preparation or sample processing. Could those be sort of integrated? Yeah, so that's uh, we we created your platform, a hardware platform of microscopy and a hardware and, and a software platform. So, but as we are building this, as we are doing this, we we absolutely are working together with companies like uh, Chipshop, uh, uh, Bluegent. Uh, so uh, all these guys who are in the microfluidic uh, market, I mentioned uh, the uh, guys in Jena uh, who are really uh, EPHT. Uh, really famous for, for making uh, uh, microfluidic devices. And yes, indeed, it's, it's always a part how to integrate. And you saw this uh, U shape. So there are some mechanics uh, uh, in mind where you put your microfluidic chip and then integrate it in an environment. You're working with companies together who are doing then this, uh, so to say, fueling, uh, waste handling, uh, uh, and so on. So, but everything about automation and building into machineries. But you're completely right. In microfluidics, uh, the environment at that moment is uh, the space issue, not the microscope. Well, it looks like we might have a three-side cooperation here. So Adrian from Team Photonic, 
you also have a comment on this topic? Yes, that might be a little bit off topic as it's not uh, microscopy per se, but just to mention that uh, we're exploring the um, implementation of uh, microfluidic channels, like right next to the photonic ones on our chips. We've checked it could be, it could be for instance, compatible with, uh, you know, uh, LPKF processing or, uh, or such, uh, such processes, for instance. But yeah. It's more, uh, yeah. The, 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 we, we are searching exactly for these uh, cooperations in the way what are the trends in, in, in microfluidics, uh, so microfluidics in glass, uh, so uh, you mentioned the wafer, uh, the laser uh, integration here, uh, it's about uh, water cleanliness, uh, what we are inside, so these are the thematics we are after, uh, and everybody has a specific know-how, so we are more the incubator, we are making the microscope applicable to this thing, so if it has to work outside at the river, uh, or in a boat, or, or <laughs> uh, that's us. Okay, fantastic. And getting even more back to the microscopy world, I'd like to get back to Giuseppe. Giuseppe, do you maybe also see some room for cooperation? Do you have some comments to Marcus and their technology, or maybe even integrate your, uh, your technology together? Yeah, yeah, I think that definitely uh, there are a lot of room to, to collaborate with each other. And uh, really, I mean, I, I, I'd like to stress uh, again, uh, I, I really expected that uh, in any system, uh, the, the single element detector will be substituted by this father ray detector. So uh, why not to substitute also in your system? So uh, definitely uh, we, we, our detector is adding information. So without losing any other information so why not to use also in your context so definitely that's my my comment that is clearly is a general comment but i i'm really uh, think yeah. that there is a lot of things so that, that we, we've built it up a platform okay <laughs> so we are camera independent so to say uh, we have applications where we integrate hamamatsu cameras and and and, and big sensors so uh, why not your sensor okay so if it has to be in a system it has to be automated uh, we are the incubator, so we know how to integrate sensors uh, about the data management, uh, electronic wise, uh, how to make the connectors, how to make it reliable, how to make a product that we can sell. Yeah, and, uh, and particularly the software, what you mentioned about data management, it's it's really crucial in this uh, in this context. So, and when you're coming out of machine vision, where you have uh, uh, paper recognition in yeah, in exactly. Thank you very fantastic. much for a fantastic, a fantastic request. Highlight microscopy at Epic. This is just the beginning, and you are our staff member on that topic. So be ready to give a lot more presentations and be ready to be your keynote speaker in upcoming, upcoming microscopy meeting that we are preparing. But I would like to first of all come now to the YouTube channel. I have two questions there, both of them from Toptica Photonics. The first one is, is going to face form. Uh, they are actually uh, asking a question regarding uh, is the transmissive adaptive optics design for two photon and three photon microscopy in terms of damage threshold and transmission a challenge for you? Yes, I mean, if you go with higher powers, it's definitely a, a challenge. So this is what we're uh, currently checking and evaluating. And it will also determine uh, the, 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 the range of applications we go into, uh, particularly if you think of, of 3D microprinting, which is a, a very fascinating uh, topic, and you have all kinds of operations, uh, systematic, random ones there as well. But it's definitely a challenge for any, any kind of transmissive system, which you don't have that easily for, for uh, mirror-based systems. I think that's the perfect answer for Toptica. They want to help you on that. And the final question today before closing the meeting goes to Giuseppe. Giuseppe from IIT, the question for you, they want you to tell us a little bit more specifications of your wish laser. Oh, wow. Amazing question. So thanks a lot. Uh, Priceless? <laughs> no, I'm joking. <Okay. laughs> no, but clearly, so we are working with fluorescence and in particular, we are interested in the lifetime. So definitely we need a pulse laser. The, 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 the fact that the, the pulse wave is not really a big issue in the sense that we need a picosecond pulse. We don't need femtosecond. So that's a, that's a slightly big advantage. High repetition rate, we are working with fluorescent. We want to go fast. So 100 megahertz or a little bit less, that, that's, that's important. And stable laser. So that's clearly one, 
another big uh, big request. So and uh, multi wavelength. So that's why I mentioned super continuum laser are really really uh, our our dream. So we really think that uh, we can target photo with a spectral signature. So that means that we need white light. So for doing that, we prepared to many 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 different introductions here, like Irisium, like NKT. We are gonna do a lot of introductions. I would like to say for me this meeting has been much higher my expectations. It was lovely, and I when I summarize the meeting, I want to show this slide only this slide because this for me was the highlight. EMBL was at this meeting looking for partnerships in the Epic Network, and they have these seven challenges. Let's help them. Can you help? Contact me. I will introduce you. Let's help EMBL after this meeting. Thank you very much for a fantastic afternoon. And that concludes the public part of today's meeting. If you are in our Zoom room, our informal private discussion is about to start. I call it virtual drinks with friends. And we all know follow-up is important. But for now, if you are watching on YouTube, that's where we leave you for today. Thanks to the Epic Production crew and all the sponsors for making today's event possible. More details about upcoming meetings are on our website. And if you want to get in touch with any of the participants, all you have to do is contact me directly and I will make sure you get introduced. It is all about connections. Thanks for being Epic.